it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I can see that you're trying to hold on to a sense of critique and what's wrong, whilst also having a sense of where are the more transformative or hopeful possibilities. So I want to talk today about prefigurative research methods, law reform and the abolition of legal sex status, which I'm going to refer to as decertification. Um, prefiguration is an idea that's been around for some time. Um, it challenges a linear notion of political change, which separates the means of change from change itself. So prefiguration or prefigurative politics treat the means as ends um, in the sense that they're lived, experienced, and that they shape what follows. But it also treats the ends as political means when they're taken up seemingly prematurely. So people live um, as if the world they seek is already present. So people talk about prefiguration as crossing over and undoing this kind of means-ends distinction. Um, so if you think of a very conventional politics where you campaign for change and the change happens at, at the other end, um, if the campaign is successful, um, prefiguration is a really uh, real kind of undoing of that, of that framework for thinking about change, which splits the means from the ends and says, the means can be awful, but if they achieve the ends we want, then they're good. Prefigurative politics is often associated with democratic activist forms, for instance, in protest camps, where decision-making norms emphasize horizontality, sort of egalitarian decision-making, inclusion and consensus. And it also identifies transformative ways of doing everyday life, for instance, through communal living or squatting or ecological practices um, or living as genderless and so on. And of course, what counts as prefigurative is going to change over time as practices deemed um, prefigurative in one era become part of the social mainstream in the other. And we might think of, I don't know, for some people, lesbian and gay marriage might be an example of that. But more generally, prefigurative politics and practices identify a creative energy that refuses to wait. Um, so it refuses to put off better ways of living to some indefinite future time ahead, but is about taking them up in the present. Prefigurative politics and law, though, have long been placed against each other. One is seen as a grassroots radical practice that embodies sought after norms. The other, law, an institutional structure that's typically hierarchical and backed by force. But there's a growing interest in the relationship between the two to consider how law and um, state institutions can be prefigurative. Law could be prefigurative in its form, where how it's made, the process of its making, is imbued with socially transformative values, such as care, solidarity, um, and collectivism. Law could be a way of introducing aspirational change, housing and welfare rights, ecological stewardship, religious equality, gut gender transitioning. And we might also think of these as prefigurative, as prefiguring what could be to the extent that new laws embody changes that they can't meaningfully accomplish. So that this is kind of also building in the sense of a gap between what laws, are, what laws introduce, but actually what can, they, what, they, what can they achieve, and thinking of that gap as a kind of prefigurative gap, as a kind of overstretching in what can be done. And in its pluralist form, law can provide mechanisms that progressive communities or everyday utopias take up to organise members' relations with each other, um, with outsiders or with their spaces and things. But what I want to talk about today is a different kind of prefigurative law, and that's the imaginary law reform proposal. That could be developed in all sorts of different spaces, um, but my focus here is its life as an experimental research method, and it's one I've been working with over the last four years. One of the things that inspired this was witnessing other kinds of critical legal role-playing, um, most prominently the simulated judgment writing that's emerged in recent years, such as the Feminist Judgments Project, which I imagine a number of people are aware of, and that spawned many parallel initiatives. Um, some of them are about writing new judgments for past cases, but others are about writing anticipatory judgments for the crises of the future. 
So that's about judgment writing. But what I want to talk about is writing law. Crafting a law reform proposal can be prefigurative in several respects. It can rehearse a far more democratic process for doing legislative design. It can take up radical ideas and convert them into a legal form. And it can mean acting as if a novel idea is already on the law reform table and so worthy of serious consideration despite its distance from mainstream legal thinking. And, and this last is my entry point um, into considering prefigurative law. So I spent the last four years working um, on prefigurative law reform as a critical and hopeful research method in relation to what I said was decertification a term that describes the institutional process of dismantling legal sex and gender status. So as Serena said, decertification was at the heart of a four year collaborative ESRC project that finished in 2022. And the project explored the implications of removing sex and gender as features of legal personhood in England and Wales, and the legal and gender consciousness of a wide spectrum of people towards such a reform. We used a mixed methods approach. Um, we conducted a survey on attitudes to legal gender and its reform, which became extremely controversial, unfortunately, but elicited over 3,000 responses. And lots of people writing in, saying their views and thoughts about the, about the survey. We carried out a couple of hundred interviews um, with organizational stakeholders, lawyers, academics, and wider publics. And we held focus groups um, with legal professionals, government officials, NGOs and academics to prototype law reform principles. So it was quite an array of different sorts of law of data gathering methods. So currently in England and Wales, as probably lots of people here are aware, um, you acquire your legal sex through its registration shortly after birth. And this gives rise also to a corresponding legal gender. And the two are entwined and we can talk in more detail if people want to afterwards about, is it legal sex, is it legal gender, what's the relationship between them? Both can be changed through formal legal transitioning under the terms of the Gender Recognition Act 2004. Legal sex and gender are often treated as an issue of documentation and the relentless requirement to disclose or confirm one's category membership in a form-filling process. But while the significance of legal sex and gender status is hard to fully unravel, and maybe much less than some people imagine in terms of its importance, its reach extends beyond form-filling to the myriad contexts where legal and not just social, socially legible sex and gender make a prescribed difference or are allowed to make a difference. Um, and if we can, you know, we might think about early years, nursery and school education or employer policies around uniforms or single sex provision. So the implications of dismantling a structure that would take sex off birth certificates and void the need for a gender recognition certificate. So you wouldn't any longer have formal transitioning because you wouldn't have legal sex. It faces in three primary directions. So what it would mean for individuals if sex and gender became analogous to other social relations of inequality which don't carry legal status, um, such as ethnicity and sexuality. To its implications for those legislative enactments that currently assume a stable binary structure anchored in distinctions between women and men, female and male, same and opposite. And we can find the sedimentary deposits of gender specific law in laws relating to equality, marriage, housing, the census and reproduction amongst other areas. But decertification also faces the ongoing and changing use of sex and gender terms as normative resources for organizational policy and practice. So, you know, you, you change one bit of this legislative structure, but it has all sorts of different kind of knock on effects in different parts of social and legal and organizational life. Decertification's effects remain unknown. It, it may be the direction for law and policy travel in many countries over the coming years, but currently it hasn't been introduced in any jurisdiction and it remains a deeply controversial idea. 
A more common development in many places, including as we're just, we've just seen in Scotland, is to make transitioning easier and to demedicalise the process. And in some jurisdictions, legal reforms have also been introduced that will allow a recognition for a third gender or sex, at least for certain purposes. But when asked during interviews, some research participants said they preferred moves to multiply gender categories on the grounds that acknowledge gender's importance for those whose identity has been negated. Others saw it as a necessary intermediate step, um, like the introduction of civil partnerships in advance of equal marriage. But moving to a system of gender and sex recognition based on choice and plurality begs, begs a question. Why treat sex and gender as relevant statuses to law? If sex and gender are being increasingly hollowed out, so intended as de-standardised terms that tell us increasingly little about people's lives, are there good reasons for people to bear a legal sex status as part of their legal personhood? And this question sits behind decertification. Yet as a proposal to institute change with all the upheaval that might ensue, um, as a research project, we were repeatedly asked, what's the point? Um, particularly skeptics of the idea would say to us, why abolish legal sex status? Now, the obvious answer is to ease the lives of people who don't fit the categories to which they've been assigned. Since decertification abolishes the need to formally transition and reverts to gender as a social rather than legal phenomena. Decertification would also enable people to refuse to adopt a gender category, allowing people to live publicly and fully as agender or genderless, a subject position that I think in quite interesting ways parallels living as atheist in, in a country like Britain, despite the presence of an established church. But from a feminist perspective, there are other collective and structural reasons for proposing decertification. And these hinge on the contribution that of deproducing gender as an organizing feature of society. The deproduction of gender arguably is a worthwhile aspiration, given gender's presence as a social formation that structures inequalities in wealth, power, work, attention, space, time, status, and so on, and which contributes to the downgrading of care, connection, and non-competitive collaboration. Decertification, arguably, would withdraw the symbolic significance associated with sex and gender difference as being essential properties of subjects that need to be registered at birth and held on to for most people throughout the life course. And materially, one could argue, it might help reduce gender-based socialization, or at least its legitimacy, um, as that takes place in institutions engaged in early years, care and education. Since they couldn't use sex and gender confidently um, and authoritatively and explicitly to divide children and to allocate them to different spaces or activities or assumptions or norms or expectations and so on. But whether decertification would have these fem feminist benefits is of course uncertain. Critics told us that decertification wouldn't impact on the production of gender as an asymmetrical system of difference, but it would simply make it harder for women to reference sex for equality purposes, um, such as in maintaining women-only spaces uh, and for positive action um, initiatives. And a council official we talked to said, not having designated legal gender, it's not going to like do away with the whole patriarchal society that we live in. And a trade union official commented, um, it's like taking a number plate off a car and saying you've changed the car. You haven't changed the car and the car is still a car. That's not gonna deal with pollution, is it? Decertification though, wouldn't mean the removal of sex or we would propose gender from equality law. What it would do is separate out the remedial uses of gender categories from an insistence that membership in these categories um, should be legally defined and determined. 
There are different ways of organising positive action which don't require legal category membership because this is one of the areas of pushback. You know, if you don't have legal sex and gender status, how will you have affirmative action or positive action? But three ways emerged in our research that would allow positive action to, to, to continue effectively. One takes, um, for instance, women's experiences as the impetus and basis for provision, but without naming the beneficial class. So it's open to anyone who sees that they would benefit from what's available. And a local authority officer told us about their returners program. We didn't say specifically women. We said anyone who's had a career break for over two years, but they had in mind this would, might well be women's experience. A second uses categories such as women to signpost the provision offered, but welcomes anyone who self-identifies as benefiting. A public agency manager told us about their women's leadership program, and they said, if you identify as a woman, do come along. It's about addressing the underrepresentation of women in senior positions and supporting and identifying future talent. We're not going to turn around and say to non-binary people, no, you can't come. And what that um, comment also shows really is how, in the ways in which policymakers might think about this, identifying as a woman from, a, from their perspective, kind of segues into identifying as benefiting from women-oriented provision, regardless of a person's gender identity. But a third approach, or a third way of thinking about this area is focuses on opportunities that are oversubscribed, such as um, the example of all women parliamentary shortlists, which are permitted in Britain as a deliberate positive action measure to counter sex-based um, underrepresentation in Parliament. And controversy here, I don't know if people remember, erupted a few years ago about who counts as a woman, and it was particularly about whether trans women counted as women, and the Labour Party said they took the approach that they did. But what you see with critics of self-identification is a demand that legal sex does the funnelling work to exclude people who are legally male. And critics of decertification, as I've said, have pointed to the impossibility of doing this once a person's sex is no longer legally determined and regulated. But one of the things that our research led us to think about is whether really too much reliance is placed on formal sex. And this for a legal academic is, you know, is a source of a lot of, of, of attention really, like how important is formalization? So one option for things like um, all women parliamentary shortlists or, or parliamentary shortlists for groups who are underrepresented, which could be other genders, or if we expanded the law, it could be other constituencies, other ways of defining constituencies also, would be that you work with self-identification, um, but in conjunction with a more deliberative assessment where candidates would be expected to talk about what the category means to them, their experience of it, their representational plans and so on. So the idea that this opportunistic person would claim to be a woman and kind of helicopter in could be dealt with through a person having to talk about, about their experiences as being a woman and being excluded, marginalised, subordinated and so on, and what they would bring as, as a woman candidate. Um, so this kind of assessment can be problematic, and it's problematic for all the reasons that positive action is a limited structure that, that addresses the ways in which inequality operates but doesn't address the causes of inequality, it just keeps reallocating places. So there's problems with positive action in many ways, but, but it still is a measure that can work quite quickly to change who, who occupies positions. But obviously if you had um, a parliamentary assessment where you chose some people according to positive action and they had to explain what it meant to be a woman and other people just came um, in a different way, that, that wouldn't work. Um, but what it recognises, if you think of all women parliamentary shortlist so that you are only choosing um, a, you've got a shortlist of women candidates out of which you will choose who is going to be your prospective parliamentary candidate is that it recognizes the substantive character of representation that it's not sufficient that you just happen to say you're a woman or you just happen to have legal status as a woman for it to be a meaningful form of representation that gender functions as a practice with a history rather than being some static category or condition. 
And that assessment has necessarily an informal context dependent aspect. Critics of decertification tend to load law and formal processes more generally with all this sort of chiseling and funneling work. But getting it right isn't just the law's business. In the case of all women shortlists, it involves other people's deliberations and assessments, whether it's a party selection panel or it's the whole of a, of a local constituency membership. And that has benefits, but it also, of course, has risks. So in the rest of this talk, I want to step back, the chair stepping back to, from the specific study of decertification to ask what can we learn from such a prefigurative law reform project? And I'm asking this on the basis that decertification is just one example of such a project. And we can talk about other examples of what it would mean to do a prefigurative law reform project um, shortly. Opening a research project with imagined proposal for reform inverts the conventional socio-legal method which tends to start with a problem to identify and investigate, and then it turns to solutions at the end. So why start with a solution, treating it as if it was already up for legislative debate? I want to suggest that asking people to engage with an imaginary law reform proposal has several research benefits. First, it can provide a distinct lens through which to analyze the status quo. Starting with a solution can produce, interestingly, more systemic accounts of the problem that the solution is a solution to, since the focus is on the difference that reform might make rather than on its advocacy, who's arguing for it, which often then gets tied to specific interests and an already organised public that say, this is the agenda, this is what we are wanting to pursue. Decertification, as I've said, may meet some people's self-identified needs, but it's also an intervention in the production of gender-based needs, interests, and subjectivity more generally. And this places the research in the terrain of ontological formation, of, of how, does, how does beingness and what it is to be, I mean, we were talking earlier about um, persons, what is it to be a person? Um, and that includes the complex ways that societies produce gender-differentiated subjects. So in this sense, Starting with a solution may go beyond what people say they want, since such wants are already the consequences of how society is structured. But then what validates the proposal? If people don't say they want it and there aren't particular interests or needs that it obviously responds to, how do we know it might be any good? In her work on the imaginary reconstruction of society, the utopian scholar Ruth Levitas suggests that one aspect of this method is archaeological. Um, of identifying and piecing together existing and past aspirations for change. So a proposal like decertification can help to uncover glimpses of desire for a post-gender society or for radically different ways of doing gender. It also brings you to the question of values. As I said, if, if, if we can't, you know, that one way of, of, of legitimating the proposal might be to say, well, we can find glimpses of other ways of doing gender that this proposal really speaks to, of like, it's, it's, it's a strategy for moving to a post-gender society. There are different ways to think about the values that are important, whether they're values of care or social justice or egalitarianism or for some people freedom and so on. And then you think, well, how does this proposal link to the values that are at the heart? Um, of what I want to explore or advance. But asking people about decertification also elicits more critical, pessimistic and prosaic responses. Asking people about a legal change, um, and one that many found untimely or too radical, prompted people to voice their present day attachments, their concerns, their priorities, and to say why decertification was wrong or at least wrong now. So positing legal reform in the course of conducting interviews brings people's counter commitments to the surface. And it also exposes the terms through which those counter commitments and other attachments are articulated. Talking to people about a proposal to um, withdraw legal status from sex and gender 
was met with both proprietary and nativist accounts of gender. So some non-trans women suggested that the category of women belonged to them and was defined by them, and a kind of like we were here first sort of politics. Um, and I'll return to the counter-performativity of proposing a radical proposal shortly. But a legal proposal like decertification doesn't just reveal existing forms of gender consciousness. It also reveals changes in practice, which we might think of as part of an informal law reform movement that's already underway within civil society and governmental bodies, where rules, policies, um, and kind of emerging customary responses diverge from the sex status commitments of state law. Many trade unions, um, NGOs, governmental bodies described their understanding of gender as being plural, mutable, and self-identified, despite the fact that state law uh, officially took a different approach. The council equality officer told us, we do have an, op an, an option for MX, for example, that we put in our register and on our forms. By asking the question, we're trying to start to count and trying hard to identify different people's needs. A leisure centre manager we interviewed described how he advised staff not to direct people to specific changing rooms um, based on their appearance, and they said, if someone comes in and says, where are the changing rooms? We say we've got a male changing room there and a female changing room there and an accessible changing room there and allow them to make that choice. We can think of these um, developments as instances of soft decertification. But the emergence of gender policies and norms at odds with state laws fixed binary status also proved precarious during the four years of our research. So the sort of informal kind of holding law at a bit of a distance wasn't, wasn't a very um, robust approach, at least in the short term. As opposition to self-identification grew, bodies that had adopted a self-ID approach started to face pressure, legal and political, to revert, um, to use the equality language of sex rather than gender, to treat sex and gender as binary and not plural, and to recognize people's sex and gender as fixed and legally inscribed rather than as flexible and self-authorized. A second value in studying prefigurative law reform is that it provides a way of exploring in detail a radical change that's remained under, under attended to because it seems far-fetched. Asking people their views on an emerging a proposal elicited accounts of its strengths and weaknesses that could be helpful for its, for its development. And you're kind of rehearsing a change to, to learn more about what that change could mean. Um, as well as, as, as I've described, the emotional charge it, it, and feelings it drew. Prefigurative law reform is a radical rehearsal of a law that may be for another time. And so one modality for its development can be that of slow law. And this is a phrase I've been thinking about. Less as a critical account of law as it is that law is just too slow, but as a way of taking up radical, seemingly untimely changes and countering their dismissal on the grounds that the time just isn't right where people want you to push it into the long grass because they say it's not right for now hesitation about embarking on a contemporary legal reform in this area was mentioned by several interviewees and a member of an lgbt equality ngo told us we wanted the Equality Act to be better, but now we wouldn't touch it with a barge pole because it's just not worth risking the meagre rights everyone has. Because in this climate, you're not going to get it better for everyone across the board, regardless of whether it's LGBT, race, face, faith, anything. We wouldn't support anyone bringing that up for reform at the moment. We're not in safe times. And that was, I think, a couple of years ago, that interview, but I think it's still quite apt. But bringing up reform can be done in different ways, and it doesn't have to mean pursuing immediate restructuring. Slow law can ask, what can we do now to advance longer term projects? Recognising that possibilities and constraints fluctuate according to different temporal contexts. 
and recognizing that change can happen rhizomatically, not necessarily, not necessarily linearly. So, you know, if you think of how grass spreads rather than a tree, you can think of law reform in that way. Slow law foregrounds process. And here it draws from the prefigurative tenet that the means of change shape what come to exist. Like slow food or slow cities, it can be a creative, participatory, even pleasurable way of advancing radical change. Prefigurative law reform proposals may explicitly or tacitly present legislation as the mode of change, but they can also operate more symbolically as a designation or a kind of name for a transformative assemblage involving a slew of practices, policies, norms and laws that hollow out the legal significance here of sex and gender in advance of any formal dismantling. Law reform projects have much to learn here from critical design studies and prototyping methods which iteratively produce versions of the reform under attention. In critical prototyping, the aim isn't simply to move linearly towards a kind of perfect functionality. You know, you keep making new prototypes and eventually you'll get to the best, best outcome. But from a critical prototyping perspective, it's about creating things that stimulate and prompt. Um, so proposing new law can also invert law reform's conventional funneling structure where a lot of stuff goes in and something far narrower and more modest comes out. So if you think of the typical socio-legal project where you start with lots of possible options and ways, th ways of thinking, and you eventually might, might really narrow down to a single legal proposal. But in a sense, critical prototyping by using law reform as a prompt and a thing to stimulate opens up. So it, it prompts instead a kind of flourishing of paths out from a single starting point. <coughs> In this way, decertification as a law reform idea forms an entry point, not an end point. A way of prompting ideas, concerns and questions and not necessarily of resolving them. And in connecting decertification to a more expansive agenda, critics' objections proved helpful. And I'm sure most, men, most of you probably have read um, these stories in the papers and discussed them with other people around women's sports or single sex provision, prisons. And these were presented by some as major stumbling blocks to abolishing legal sex. And faced with these kinds of obstacles, there's a strong temptation to speak back and to explain, to demonstrate how um, activities and spaces can operate even if legal sex status is removed. So you say, well, this is how sports can, how we will know who are women and who are men for women and men's sports, even though we don't have legal sex or, or other kinds of single sex um, activities and spaces. But the prefigurative aspect of prefigurative law reform pushes discussion in a different direction. Um, so this means rethinking fairness in sports in more comprehensive ways as well as reconsidering what sporting competition is for. It means rethinking safety and well-being among people who are incarcerated, as well as more fundamentally and critically um, rethinking incarceration itself. The focus on category allocations of who gets to count as what, um, which is at the heart of the current conflict, who gets to count as a man, who gets to count as a woman, can he be something else? can be supplemented, even if not entirely displaced, by a kind of more radical or more um, fundamental and long-term political project that's oriented to more transformative notions of social justice. And this takes me to a third aspect of prefiguring law as a research method, what it brings into being. Fashioning a law reform proposal isn't just a tool for knowledge generation, or for expressing dissatisfaction and demanding change. It also acts, and I want to briefly mention two ways in which it acts. One is the performativity of the proposal, and we can understand this in both aligned and non-aligned ways. Utopian scholars often talk about the critical distance that utopias offer by showing how things could be otherwise. They help to denaturalize taken for granted aspects of contemporary life. Although, as Barrett, Karen Barrett reminds us, the tools of critique aren't separate um, from what's critiqued. 
So utopias emerge from the world that they simultaneously mark themselves as apart from. But, you know, but, but just holding that slightly in abeyance. Um, foregrounding how legal sex is marked and rendering it remarkable, invited participants to recognise legal sex as a social rather than natural fixture and to reconsider its value. And our interviews demonstrated many of those kinds of ah yes moments. But asking people about decertification could also have strengthened a critical um, opposed response, contributing to the development of an anti-reform framing that was also a legal framing, anchored in a sex nativist discourse of rights, and I'm saying rights um, deliberately, of rights, um, safety, formalization, class interests. And also a stressing of the real as a realm of material and for some biological life that's distinct and separate from its imagining. The second aspect of making, though, is the material creation of something new. Prefigurative law reform research sits at the interstices of real and imaginary legal action. Like academic judgment projects, it can be seen as a way of simulating through role play the law reform process. But it also means fashioning real proposals. Um, these pro proposals aren't authorised by conventional authorities and they lack formal pathways into Parliament. But this absence doesn't simply enhance their fictive qualities. In a sense, it, it can also contribute to their realness as prefigurative proposals since they rehearse and trial and also establish um, more horizontal, less pragmatic, politically risky ways of developing law reform. So we could say they're real as um, they are what law reform processes should come to be. And in that sense, they, um, they characterise what a real progressive law reform proposal might look like. I mean, that's a, a contentious point, but, but one can think about real in quite different ways. As a law reform proposal that operates outside conventional processes, the future of a proposal such as decertification is uncertain and open-ended. It doesn't and hasn't delivered a new law. But what comes into being can also change. Um, the afterlife of a prefigurative law reform project is worth attending to. Um, and being an academic project, what gets made also becomes its own research object. Prefigurative law research methods track what the development of a radical proposal does. It might be a lively, unpredictable actant in a political and legal field, or it might die. And it might also come back to life in another form. For our research on decertification, we're probably in early days in this respect. Um, during the project, some critics used our research to crystallise why legal sex was important to assert, as I've said, the binary and fixed character of sex, why sex rather than gender matters, and to hail decertification as the slippery slope's dangerous bottom. So this was the place where more moderate seeming reform would end up. Um, but for others, it was an anticipatory representation of something utopian, as a place beyond present day pragmatic politics. And in this sense, decertification became a, a hopeful name for an imaginative project for gender change beyond the specific and really very narrow question about legal sex. And somebody from an NGO said to us, I think that one of the challenges with legal reform is that because it's incremental, it's always bound to what's one step away from where we currently are. The kind of radical in me always wants to think, what is the unimaginable thing? And if we can try to take the imaginative leap to imagine the unimaginable, then I think we create the space to do the work that happens on the way, rather than foreclosing opportunity before it's even got going. So I'm just going to very briefly conclude. Prefigurative law reform research provides a method for critically analysing the status quo, identifying problems that have become submerged and that surface in the course of developing an imaginary proposal. For considering novel ways of organising social life in the absence of a taken for granted structure like sex and gender. For formulating change beyond what's presently perceived as viable. 
and for, conduct for conducting reflexive research on what happens when academic research intervenes in a legal and policy arena, how it also becomes both reimagined and rematerialized in the process. In this way, prefigurative law reform takes its place within a repertoire of critical methods. In my view, um, imagining new progressive modes of social organization is crucial at a time when even minor progressive change can seem quite out of reach. And academic research can contribute to this process. We could consider other kinds of prefigurative law reform projects, such as the abolition of money, or national borders, or prisons, or the development of new entitlements and structures. These might be taken up from a research place of support, but they can also be taken up critically um, to consider what researching such proposals um, both illuminates and what it does. It's easy for transformative endeavours to be dismissed as far-fetched, indulgent luxuries um, that should be swept aside like childish things. Alternatively, law and institutional action be can become subject to the critical imperative to be cleared away, to make room for essential change through grassroots means. Prefigurative law reform refuses both of these moves. Instead, it makes claims on the techniques and possibilities that an institutional structure such as law offers, and it provides one method for utilising it in the form of a proposal that rehearses the imagined pursuit of radical change. I'll stop there. Thanks.